I would embarrass myself if I tried to talk about queuing networks or something like that. I'm just out of touch on that. I'm an old man now. So. Uh, but I thought I could share some of my experiences and perspective on industrial engineering over the long period of time I was involved with it. I was an undergraduate math major, so I chose industrial engineering. That question was just asked of the students in the panel session there. Uh, my story was uh, I was talking to an advisor at Harvard about uh, my course schedule. I just had to get him to sign it. But I was sitting outside his door, and inside there was another student uh, asking a question about how would I use this? And the professor got mad at him. He said, you'll never be a mathematician if you think like that. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, I guess I'm not a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> so I went looking for something where I could use the math. I like math, but I wanted to be able to use it. So that's how I find it. I, uh, that was a digression. What, what was I playing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was going to share my perspective so of what happened, how I got into it, what happened over the years, how it changed, how I changed, and what I thought about the future. And then I, I wrote up the abstract that way and was almost ready to send it in. And I got to looking at it and I said, that's just a bunch of personal opinions. And my opinions aren't important, any more important than anyone else's. That's not worthy of a distinguished lecture in honor of Alan Pritzker. So I thought some more. So I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I started thinking about what does it mean to be a distinguished lecturer? And my first thought, of course, was that you have to do something important. And I have nothing. <laughs> So I thought more about what does it mean to be distinguished. Well, you can distinguish two things if you can tell them apart. There's a difference. So maybe I just have to be different. <laughs> that I think I can do. So I'm going to do two parts to this. For the distinguished part, it won't be important, but it will be different. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'll give the lecture part as a part. <laughs> so that's my plan. Hope you're not disappointed. For my something different, I want to construct, with your help, a magic square. But one like you've never seen before. One that I'm sure you've never seen before because no one's ever seen it before. We're going to do it here and now for the first time. That's my something different. So for those of you who don't remember or never knew, a magic square is a square array of numbers. A bit of math here. Nothing very deep. Here's all you need to know. We have to arrange those numbers in the square so that every row, column, and bag will add up to the same total. That's a magic square. You probably learned that as a kid. Maybe forgot about it. I did when I was about eight or ten. I played with it for a while and then lost interest because it's like a toy that you play with and it only does one thing. You lose interest after a week or so, and you set it aside and forget about it. That's what happened to me. But here is an example. Uh, that's the Lo Shu Square, and according to Chinese legend, that goes back to 2600 BC. Now that's before there's any documented evidence of anything, before we had numbers the way we do now. So according to the legend, this emperor was walking beside the river on the turtle with these dots on his back. And you arrange it into numbers the way we do now the Arabic, modern Arabic numbers. It's the numbers one through nine arranged in a square so that everything adds up to uh, 15 in every direction. That's a simple magic square, sometimes given as a puzzle. It's a little bit difficult, but you can solve that and figure it out. There's a very interesting history, though. It moved west, apparently along the Silk Road through India. India had it for quite a long time. There were ancient texts there. Uh, moved in Mesopotamia. The Babylonian Empire that lasted for a thousand years, and most have forgotten now. They made a big deal of it. Uh, they made it part of their religion. They worshipped the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, major planets. And they associated magic squares with each one of them. And they named them. 
that's the Jupiter and Mars squares. Uh, I'm just using them as examples. Uh, the 4 by 4 uses numbers 1 through 16, and adds up to 34 in every row column diagonal. 5 by 5 uses numbers 1 through 25, adds up to 65 in all those directions. Those are normal, common magic squares you can read about anywhere. We want to do it a little differently. We're not going to use the ordinary numbers. We'll use some numbers that we make up here on the spot. And then at least in that way, it'll be something different. Hopefully, more. So, uh, how hard can it be? <laughs> the number of ways of arranging 25 distinct objects is 25 factor factorial. Approach. That's about on the order of 10 to the 25th. <laughs> One of those combinatorial numbers that is too large to imagine. So let me try this way of picturing it. If you've got a computer now and you're going to start to exhaust the arrangements of 25 distinct objects, and you can do it at the rate of a million per second, computers can probably do that now. You can get to about 10 to the 13th in a year. The age of the universe is estimated 13.8 billion years, which is about 10 to the 10th. We're not there yet. You multiply those together, you can get about 10 to the 23rd. We've got to get to 10 to the 25th. So it's about four, 35 times the age of the universe at a million per second to get through those arrangements. But we don't want to do it that way. <laughs> How much time have we got? I have to turn that on. Uh, we have computers now, and of course we don't have to be dumb about this. We can use smart algorithms. We've got branch and bound, combinatorial algorithms, various kinds. So during the 70s, uh, serious people started going through using computers. Uh, and they're still doing it, by the way, using supercomputers and parallel com computing. And they enumerated all of the possible 5 by 5 magic squares. So it was about 275,000. But that's still a tiny, tiny percentage of the number of arrangements. So this is one of those hard combinatorial problems that uh, optimization people still worry about. And even with the, the current work that's going on with the fastest computers they can find and lots of dedicated people working on it, they still don't know how many 6 by 6 magic squares there are. So there's still currently active research. Now, you might wonder how I know all this stuff. Why am I so interested in magic squares? I'll get to that, but I, I wasn't before. <laughs> but I have found some very interesting things that, that intrigue me. So we're going to try. Using a little industrial engineering. Uh, back when I was teaching probability in 230 or 336 or 536, I found I had to motivate the subject. A lot of people don't like probability. And I tried to make an argument briefly that the future is determined by a mixture of three different kinds of things that I label with the, as the three C's. There's cause and effect, the things that are predictable from laws of nature, a consistent behavior in the universe. And that's why we study hard science and math and logic. That's the predictable part. But then we have human beings, free will, and even animals, animate objects, making choices. And that's a lot less predictable. And that's why we study psychology, human factors, economics, all the social science things, trying to get our arms around that factor. And then there's whatever is left. We call that chance. Not predictable in the ways the other are, but we can describe chance through probabilities and statistics. And that's why we study those. And then I'd say with some pride that industrial engineering is the only discipline I know of, certainly the only engineering discipline, that even attempts to get its arms around all three of those factors. I think that's one of the things that makes IE great. We don't all succeed, but we tried. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do. Now for the chance part of this, 
I brought a 10-sided die. Uh, it's made of foam. I don't think it'll hurt anybody if we toss it around. It has uh, 10 digits, 0 through 9. I'll toss it out. That's the chance part. I think I'll start it over here, and we can toss it around the room. Catch it. <laughs> OK, you can roll the die. See what number you get. One. OK, now I'll give you a choice. <laughs> you can take that number, and we'll use it. Or you can roll it again and get another chance number. Or you can just name a number. <laughs> but it's your choice. You, you keep the one? OK. Toss the die to somebody else. OK. Roll a die. You get the same option. I got seven. Seven. OK. You can use that one. Uh, you can try it again. Six. Six? OK. We got a one and a six. Toss the die. OK. We have a one and a six. For the, no, wait, no, I want to use a uh, two-digit number, okay. but I can form 16 or 61. 61. 61, that's your choice. You could roll a die and determine randomly if you wanted to. 61 is the number we'll go with. Okay, that's going to be one of the numbers in our square. We need 25 numbers. <laughs> We're not going to get them by randomness anymore. We start to use some logic. <laughs> Uh, 61 will be one of our numbers. Now, we could come upward from that, but we're going to get into some pretty big numbers if we do that. And when it comes time to the end, when we have to start adding up numbers, that may be a burden. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we have calculators. We have smartphones with calculators. So it wouldn't make any difference if you're using a calculator. We can use 16 and count upward from there. We try to count downward from there, 25 numbers. We'll get in the negative number. Probably don't 61 want that. Was the 61, that's right. OK, we'll use 61. Now, we, we can make it the, the highest number or the lowest number. Or to give you another option, we could make it a middle number. <laughs> no pressure. So, so, no, you chose the 61. Cross the die to somebody else. Somebody else has to choose. Highest, lowest, or middle? Highest. Okay. I think that's a good choice. That's, that's what I would say. <laughs> 61. Okay. I want to put that in one of the corners for reasons that will become apparent in a minute. But toss the die. It could go in any one of these corners. <laughs> Upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right. Uh, lower right. Lower right, 61. Right? OK. This is a combination of choice and chance so far. Now we start thinking. We want 25 numbers. We can count downward from 61. Count down 24 numbers, we'll get to the lowest number. Or we could do something a little more interesting, like count downward by twos. It could take us down to a lower number. And we'd have the interesting byproduct that we would end up with all odd numbers. We've got a high enough number here we can go down by threes if you want to do. Before you get into negative numbers. I don't think we want to go by fours, but uh, Toss the die, and somebody else decide how we want to do this. <laughs> Six. No. You want to go down by ones or twos? Twos, OK. So we have to go down. The lowest number will be 48 below this. All right, count down by twos. We've got to get down 25 numbers. That's 48. So we have to subtract 48 from this. Help me out here now. I'm an old guy. I'm losing my abilities here. If we subtract 48, what do we get? <laughs> 13? Are you agreed? That'll be our lowest number. Now, I'm working on the diagonal here. What's 
what's the midpoint between these two numbers? So take a sample mean. Add them up and divide by two. Okay. This is IE. 37. Okay. Now think about it. This is the middle between the lowest and highest number. We fill this in with the other numbers that are between 13 and 61, the other odd numbers. And we balance them out properly for every number below, you know, certain number below the middle, there'll be another number above the middle. So the average will be still that middle number 37. And if we have a whole bunch of numbers, the average of which is 37, and we add up five of them, like in any row or column or diagonal, five times 37 will give us our target sum. Right? So what's five times 37? 185? Mm -hmm. That's our target. And here, we're already three-fifths of the way there. Right? So we need another total of 74 split between those two cells. So let's split the difference. 25. Check me on this. 48. No, 49. They all are odd, right? 49. OK. This much was easy. We had a lot of freedom. Cells were all empty when we started. We got all the numbers available. We're starting to lose degrees of freedom. Right? We've got to be careful. But I'd like to do this in such a way that I keep that balanced symmetry if I can. So, for example, when I count up by 2 from 13, I get 15. Oh. Should I count up or should I count down? Cost a die. I can count up from the bottom or down from the top. Doesn't matter. Here comes the die. Watch your head. <laughs> down from the bottom or up from the top? Down from the top or up from the bottom? Down from the top. Okay. I'll make it a little harder. We've got to count down by twos from 61. So 59, um, I still got a lot of freedom here. Let me... Now opposite that, I want to put a complement so the sum will be 74. So that's 15, right? So that goes right opposite. So by keeping that balance, I really only have to solve half of this. I have to put in the numbers that will be half of it, and the other half will be determined. Okay? So, let's see, we're counting down. 59, 57 will be the next one. Let's try it there. 55. I want to count through so I make sure that I don't miss any and I don't duplicate any. So I want to go systematically. 57, so now I have to go to 55. And then 53. Then 51. Then 49 is here. We'll do 47, 46, no, 45, 43, 41, 39, 37 is here. I'm half done, so I can fill in the rest by subtraction. 
No. 25 is there. 23. 21. 19. 17. 15. We're done. Okay, if you've got a calculator and know how to use it, <laughs> uh, would you please uh, pick out a row or column or diagonal and check? Yeah, so every row adds up 285. But we did something more here. We made it symmetric. Now, the symmetric magic squares are a small subclass of all magic squares. That's not a, you know, one, one percent or something like that. It's a very small percent. But we made it symmetric. But more than that, it's pan diagonal, which is an even smaller subclass. Pan diagonal. I'm going to start showing some of these. Pan diagonal means that even these broken diagonals, like these four plus this one, add up. And these three plus these two. And these two plus these three. And this one plus this one. These four. And the same going the other way. <laughs> All these broken diagonals add up. We made it pan diagonals. Uh, we made some excellent choices, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, pan diagonal is particularly significant because uh, pan diagonal magic squares are shiftable. And what I mean by that is I could take this left column and move it over to the right and you still have a magic square. The reason that works is that the main diagonal becomes this broken diagonal. That's why it works. The, if you shift this over here, of course, the columns remain the same, the rows remain the same, except they're rearranged. It's the, col the diagonals that are tricky. So we made a pan diagonal, and we got this shiftable. We could make a wallpaper of this magic square <coughs> paper your whole wall, and then wherever you move a five by five grid, that's a magic square where every row, column, and diagonal, and a bunch of other things add up to 185. So by being both symmetric and n diagonal, we have what's called an ultra magic square, which is extremely rare. They found these only when they did that computer work, and they managed to find a few specific cases using the numbers 1 through 25 where they got this particular property of both symmetric and pan diagonal. Now, think about this. Let me use a different color here. Let me use a different sheet here, too. Because it's symmetric, I can take this square and this square and add them. I get 74. And I can take this one and this one and add them, and I get 74. And then add the center. So that little plus sign pattern adds up to 185. But it does even if I move it. <laughs> and if I move it off the edge, I just wrap around to this side. So I can move this to any one of the 25 squares, that little pattern, and I get Another pattern of five numbers that add up to our target number. But that was just one little pattern. I could take this number and this number and this number and this number and do the same. Or I could take this number and this number, which are opposite, this number and this number, plus the center, and I can move those anywhere. So I get a hundred more patterns that operate that. Now, think a little deeper. I can actually pick out any cell. Say that one. And it's opposite. Any other cell. Maybe that one. And it's opposite. And add the center. 
I get another pattern. So there are many, many patterns of five cells that add up to the same target sum. Somebody asked how many. <laughs> I happen to know. <laughs> 1,397. Okay, that's the distinguished part of my lesson. <laughs> Not important, but different. I hope you agree. Uh, I'm pretty sure that no one on Earth has ever seen this before. These particular numbers and these particular numbers. Because there's some mathematical possibility, but it's so vanishingly small that I'm confident that no one has ever seen that before. So I'm ready to move on to the lecture part of my lecture. Are there any questions? <laughs> <laughs> yes? How did you know how to arrange them where you could have put them in any pattern when you were doing by two? No, it's a very specific arrangement. It had to be done in one way. Actually, not one way. I know 32 different ways I can do it. Uh, but I'm glad you asked, because that's what I want to talk about. <laughs> uh, what I did is something I discovered. These ultra magic squares are so unusual and fairly recently discovered that most people find it amazing that they even exist. And I don't think anyone, until very recently, ever imagined that there would be a way to construct them the way we just did. But there is, obviously. I found one. I found, actually, a bunch of ways. It didn't matter what the numbers were. I knew before I started it was going to succeed. And I'm ashamed to tell you how easy it was. <laughs> You probably thought I must be really smart. I wish. <laughs> uh, maybe you thought I worked really hard to find this out. Or, no. But the really surprising thing to me that I find hard to believe even now is that apparently I was the first one to find it. You would just admit it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, but I seem to be the first, and I don't know why. Uh, so I think, even though magic squares aren't very important, there might be value to you in explaining how this happened. There might be some lessons there, I think there are, that you could apply to your own area of specialization, or where, wherever you work, whatever you're doing, because something really surprising happened here to me in, in making these discoveries. So let me walk you through how it happened. Uh, first of all, I was not thinking about either magic squares or this other thing, which is vector spaces. I wasn't thinking about either one. And there was an event, the details don't matter, but I was watching a video, I was watching it because it was a guy I had met several years earlier and I was just interested in what he had to say. And he started talking about magic squares and I, I knew about magic squares, I wasn't particularly interested. My mind started to wander and I suddenly realized, just in a flash, I made this connection between magic squares and vector spaces. As I told you, I, I've known about magic squares since I was eight or ten. I learned about vectors and vector spaces. I think my freshman year in college, probably most of you did. Probably don't remember it. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I was teaching it all those years. You know, it's in, in linear programming and it's in Markov chains and standard engineering math. So. I want to explain how I felt at the time, and for those of you who can't relate to the idea that magic squares are vector, that's it in four words. That's the connection and the recognition I had that took place in an instant. For those of you who can't relate to that, let me give you an analogy. Suppose when you were a child, you saw a funny little creature, and 
you didn't know what it was, and you asked your parents, and they said, that's a, ch a chihuahua, a Mexican chihuahua. So now you know. Next time you see one, you know it's a Mexican chihuahua. They're not that common, but every once in a while you see one, and you, you know what a Mexican chihuahua is. But then late in life, when you're in your 70s, you happen to see somebody walking down the street with a chihuahua on a leash. And you think, for the first time in your life, oh my gosh, a chihuahua is a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I never realized that. <laughs> okay, now how do you feel? <laughs> really foolish, right? Yeah. <laughs> like i got to be the last person in the world to realize this. <laughs> and how could I have gone all those years without realizing that? So I, you know, I'm embarrassed. I'm certainly not going to tell anybody that I just realized that magic squares are vectors. I mean, they were, in my mind, I was familiar with both. And I could have made that connection 60 years early when I was 17, but I didn't. But the next morning, I woke up. It must have been bothering me. You know, after I had this recognition, I turned to other things and forgot about it. But overnight, I, I must have been bothered because I started to wonder who, who was first to realize that magic squares were backwards. I wondered if it was some famous mathematician, an Euler or a Descartes or you know, somebody. And how long ago was it? 50 years, 100, 200? Uh, Descartes had this Cartesian plane, and it might have been him, but the terminology of modern vector spaces wasn't established then. I, you know, I just started wondering about it. Now, if it had taken any great effort, I probably wouldn't have bothered. I was just mildly curious. But I'm retired. I, I can do whatever I feel like <laughs> <laughs> any morning. <laughs> if I had responsibilities to go to, I, I'm sure I wouldn't have done anything. But, or if it took a lot of work to go to a library or something like that. But we have the internet now, so I could do a Google search and check it out. So I was that interested, enough interested. I put it in some keywords, spent 20 minutes, half an hour, something like that. And strangely, I thought, I didn't find it. Now, at this point, I'm, I'm absolutely certain this is well known. It has to be. It's so obvious once you see it. It has to be common knowledge among people who know about both vector spaces and magic squares. So I'm puzzled why I'm not finding this on the internet. Of course, I get a lot of ads for people trying to sell me tickets to Orlando Magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, then there's a whole lot of stuff on magic squares. So I'm puzzled at this point. And I've got time because I'm retired. So I spent two years researching this, exhausted. I got everything I could get my hands on on the internet. I started buying books, got everything on Amazon I could get. I started searching out rare books, books long out of print. I spent probably $2,000 on rare books. Uh, I found some very interesting stuff. I had an Arabic text translated from the 10th century. Uh, finding all sorts of interesting stuff that's driving me on, but I'm not finding the simple comment, magic squares are vectors. I got a few examples of people getting right up to the doorstep of it, proving that the properties of vectors are satisfied. You take two magic squares and add them together of the same dimension, of course, and you add cell by cell, you get another magic square. If you just think about it, that's fairly obvious, and as a formal proof, it's a high school algebra exercise. And I found that. If you multiply cell by cell by a scalar quantity, you get another magic square. Again, you can do that in your head. So that was noticed and observed in a couple places, but no obvious follow through to the questions that, well, if it's a all of the magic squares of a certain size form a vector space. What's the dimension of the space? That's a little algebra exercise. It took me about five minutes. For four by four magic square, the dimension is eight. There's 16 numbers in there, 16 variables. 
Then constraints, there's some dependencies to worry about. So we just work it out. We can form a matrix and get the rank of the matrix. And, and so the answer is A. Easy. What does a basis vector look like? So for Euclidean space, you know, we've got these 1, 0, 0, and 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1, the unit vectors that we conventionally use. That's one basis for Euclidean space, but they don't have to be orthogonal. There's other bases. It's not unique. But I was looking for, is there a basis that is clean and easy to work with? So I set about trying to find one. And actually, I wanted to find all eight. If I could do that in a way that seems practical, I could form every 4 by 4 magic square. So here's the th first thing I did. It took two minutes. The very first thing I tried. I put a 1 in the upper left corner. That takes care of the first row, the first column, and that diagonal that starts in that corner. I go to the second column. Can't go in the second row because that's in the diagonal. It's already covered. Put the first place it can go. Put the next one the first place it can go. The last one goes right into place. I'm done. That's one. That's clean. I even thought almost immediately. There's an easy way to remember that. If you think of that grid as being floor tiles, 12 by 12 floor tiles, and you're standing outside the grid on the bottom, you step forward on your right foot in the first row, and step forward with your left foot, and outward with your right foot, and into the corner with your left foot. Look right, left, right, left. You're just walking through the grid. You know, being outward. Okay. So that's an easy one to remember. And I like it. It's clean. I need another one, so I just reversed it. Left, right, left, right. I need some more, so do it from the top. I got four. How long is this taking? <laughs> I need four more. Do it from the sides. For a while, I thought I was done. That's eight, but it turns out they're not independent. If you take the first four, they all add, they put a one in every cell. If you take the bottom four, they put a one in every cell. That kind of tells you it's, there's a dependency there. If you take any seven of them, the eighth is dependent. So I needed to find another one. I spent another few minutes getting that. But the details don't matter. The point is, I found them. And that led to a flood or avalanche of discoveries. I had the basis. I enabled me to get several new construction methods. This is four by four magic squares I'm thinking about now. Uh, I was able to write a general formula that covers all possible magic squares. It's sort of obvious. You just take all the linear combinations of those basis vectors. You have eight variables. Those are the coefficients. Scalar multiples, and you got those basis vectors, and that, that forms every possible 4 by 4 magic square. Turns out this had been done in 1910 in a very clumsy way. It was so awkward that there was a flaw in the proof and it wasn't corrected until the 1930s. But the one I get is very clean. I got methods for reversible squares. Uh, I want to show you that. This is kind of cute. This is a reversible square. That's, I call it my patriotic square. It adds up to 1776 <laughs> in every row, column, and diagonal. The four corners, the center four, 86 different ways to add up to 1776. I turn it over, the numbers change, but they still add up to 1776 <laughs> in 86 different ways. <laughs> if I look at it from the back, <laughs> That's 1776, or this way, or in the mirror. Or <laughs> okay. Once I knew how, that took about 10 minutes how to do it. It's not, not hard when you realize what's going on. Once I started working with these reversible squares, it occurred to me that this really doesn't have to do with numbers at all. Magic squares are not about numbers, they're about patterns. Those patterns are revealed by the basis vectors I showed you. 
once you see the structure, all the mystery goes away. So then I could get geometric squares, things that don't involve numbers at all. Let me show you a couple of those. How am I doing on time? Put clock in here. We'll do it here. See the shapes there? You add them all up. By, by that I mean you superimpose in any row, column, or diagonal. And you get a yin yang. You can do it with colors. Add them up in any row, column, or diagonal, and you get a rainbow. I did it with musical notes. It plays the sound of music in any row, column, or diagonal. <laughs> the numbers don't matter. Here's one I did last weekend, just playing around. I call this pieces of pie. There's pie numerically, there's the truncated version. <laughs> there it is symbolically. Those are ink blobs. When you add them up in any row, column, or diagonal, you get the symbol. And finally, just to complete the pieces of pie, I did it with pieces of pie. <laughs> and, uh, and I get the same colors in every row. So, uh, where am I? Magicians like to do things that seem impossible, but aren't. This is a magic trick, right? Turns out that there is a magic trick that many professional magicians have been doing since the 1930s, where they get a number from the audience and they construct a magic show with that hope. They use trickery. I don't have to use trickery. I can do it for real. And in fact, it's easier than the method they use. <clears throat> and I realize that there's a possibility for professional magicians here, because until the, the world becomes aware of how easy these magic squares actually are, this is a valuable secret for a professional magician. So I wrote a book. <laughs> <laughs> and sold it to magicians. I did a print-on-demand thing, and I didn't know how many I'd sell, so I printed, I think it was 20 to start with. Uh, it eventually sold over 300, which is probably the world's demand for this. <laughs> there, there's, there's maybe four or 500 people in the world who care enough about this to buy a book on the subject. <laughs> and I made enough money to make back my Expenses on the rare books. <laughs> I was pleased with that. More importantly, it it put me in touch with a lot of people around the world who were very interested in the subject. People who had been working on magic squares and magicians who wanted to perform tricks. And they contacted me. I met some people who were, you know, John Gordon Conway, the guy who's doing the Game of Life. I got to talk to him. I was invited to give a talk at the Gathering for Gardener, you know, the Martin Gardner, little scientific American math columnist, very prolific, and there's a gathering every two years by invitation only, and I got invited to give a talk. So I'm talking to all these people, and they keep asking me questions about it. Uh, like, can you do it without any math at all? <laughs> and that led to more discoveries. Uh, and I started to broaden out into the five by five, can I find a convenient basis for 5 by 5? Yes, I do. <laughs> Dimension is 14, as it turns out. I can write a general formula for all 5 by 5 magic squares. It's easy once you have the basis. It's the linear combinations. As far as I can tell, I'm the first to publish a general formula that covers all possible 5 by 5 magic squares. So you see what I mean by this avalanche of discoveries? I got many different pattern methods. We use one to construct this square. If you'd given me a different starting corner square, I would have used a different one. I know three dozen ways of constructing an ultra magic square using arbitrary numbers. 
They're just variations of the same thing using the same basis vectors. And I could get to larger squares. I could show you some others if you're interested. I can go as big as you want. So then I wrote another book. <laughs> <laughs> and these two books are being sold through one magic door dealer who said they're the best selling books of all time. <laughs> and I, this discoveries continue to come. Once you realize what's going on, all of this comes surprisingly easy. So that raises the question of what did this take to happen? Besides extraordinary luck. <laughs> now, it, it took a certain amount of prior knowledge, which I had, but I had it 60 years earlier and I didn't think of it. And lots of other people had it and they didn't think of it. But of course, I had to know about magic squares and I had to know about vector spaces in order for it to be it. So it needed that. But it also needed a trigger event, which in my case was just seeing this guy doing this thing and it sort of struck me all of a sudden. Now the interesting thing about that was that if I had been trying to find it, I don't think I ever would have. If I'd even had in my mind consciously either magic squares or vector spaces in the previous five years, I don't think it would have occurred. It's only because I came to it with fresh eyes that the connection happened. You had to see things differently. That was the crucial element, which is important for some other purposes, I think. Then, of course, I had to follow up. If I had not followed it, if I had taken my first instinct that, oh, of course, this has to be well known, I wouldn't have gotten anywhere. I would have set aside. If I'd been not retired, but I had responsibilities, I never would have taken waste of my time. So I guess you should all retire. <laughs> I will say I've had tremendous fun being retired. And over time, I was drawn into this subject deeper and deeper by searching for who found it first. And that led to very interesting findings, particularly in old books. And that's one of the lessons of it. I think everything you need to know is on the internet. You're making a big mistake. Go back to the books that were written prior to 1950, even in the 1800s. You're going to find all sorts of stuff that will be new to you and it's forgotten. You want to cheat on your research. <laughs> Just go back to old books. <laughs> find a lot of stuff that is not in the current literature, but it's, it's there in the old books. It did not take brilliant creativity. I'm not capable of not nearly as sharp as I used to be, and I know it. But it didn't take. This was easy work, amateur level work. Didn't need advanced expertise. I wasn't doing anything sophisticated with my vector spaces or anything like that. Didn't take hard work. Didn't take a lot of time. So you should all be so lucky. <laughs> but it begs the question. How in the world could something so clear and obvious have been overlooked for so long by so many very, very smart people, way smarter than you? So that's worth thinking about. First of all, magic squares don't look like that. You think of a vector, you think of a row or a column, but that's just the way it appears. That's not the definition, that's the way it is expressed. If you want to make a magic square look like a paper roll or a column, you can just unstack the things and separate them and put them in a the row. It looks sort of funny when you try to express the constraint. But you could do that. The thing is, it's in disguise, but it's a vector because it satisfies the mathematical properties, the abstract properties, which are basically the linearity properties. You can multiply by scalar, or you can add them. You can, linear combinations are still in the space. That's, that's what was required. Also, the fact that the magic squares are usually expressed with integers, you don't think of linear algebra. 
You might think of number theory, you might think of combinatorics, maybe something else, but you don't think of linear algebra because that's real numbers. So you do have to expand your definition or your notion of magic squares a little bit into real numbers, but that's not hard if you think to do it. So uh, that, that's, that's some of the reasons it, it went un, un, unnoticed. The real discovery is that finding the base of vectors, which nobody else bothered to do, apparently. Once you see those, and you realize how simple the structure is, everything else follows. And to me now, when I see a magic square constructed by somebody else, I can look at it and just visually I see the structure because I see the underlying basis vector for it, which the cells determine. And there's, there's, I can deconstruct it and reconstruct it. It's, it's, it's easy. So there are a couple of big lessons out of this. This is what's worth remembering. If you're deeply into a subject, you know a lot about it. You're in the literature. You accept the conventions of that area of specialization. The terminology, the notation, everything. That sets up a paradigm. It really blocks you thinking about other things. A different way of looking at it. You're sort of caught in the paradigm of the conventions that are used in that area of expertise. So if you're stuck <laughs> in your research, my advice would be take a vacation. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> and make it long enough and mentally different enough so you're not thinking about your work. You're away from it for at least a week <laughs> so that you can come back with fresh eyes. As I look back on my career, I always felt a little guilty taking vacations and I tended to take my work with me. I was thinking about things when I probably shouldn't have been. If I had it to do over, I would take more vacations. Seriously. And finally, I can't think of a better example than this one. This has got to be one of the most studied things in history. For not just decades or centuries, but for millennia. Very smart people have done incredible things trying to figure out magic squares. And they've done very complicated things. They didn't do the simple things. So hopefully there's stuff like that for you to find. I, uh, I hope that these little lessons take with you and you they benefit you somehow. And I'm uh, pleased and honored to have the chance to present it to you. Thank you. topic I originally planned. I was going to give you my views of industrial engineering. <laughs> In a very indirect way, this is my view of industrial engineering. Does anyone want to know how to do it? It's shamefully easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, thank you. We actually have a good show. Are you going to show? Don't don't. But we do have a gift for you. While you, yeah, that's in there. So, thank you very much for for coming by. We greatly appreciate it. Stay tuned. He's going to show you how to show.